and then stubbornly, right, it's on paper, I had this insane plan that I wanted to follow for the next 16 weeks. And then they just keep going and going and going and somehow work their way through all these side effects. Vigorous Steve here. Let's discuss the old ways of running steroid cycles and compare that to the new and improved, the modern way of running steroid cycles. Because a lot has changed over the last couple of decades after performance enhancing drugs and steroids were introduced into the bodybuilding space. And even though some of those old ways still persist to this day, with the inclusion of new performance enhancing drugs, and the growth of the fitness industry as a whole encompassing many different sports, a lot of different protocols from the old days are now a little bit outdated. And new protocols, new drugs, more sustainable methods have been developed, which kind of make old practices obsolete. So I want to discuss that in this video. It's going to be a part of the steroid battle uh, comparison video series, but I don't want to compare steroids head on directly in this video. I just want to discuss old ways versus new ways and give you guys a little bit of a unique perspective and some food for thought for more intelligent cycle design. Because again, a lot has changed and some of the old methods you just don't hold up anymore. So we need to discard those and move on. And I also briefly want to go over the fundamentals, which form the basis of bodybuilding and fitness as a whole. Because over the last 20 years or so that I've been a part of the bodybuilding community, man, a lot has changed also. The training has changed. The nutrition has changed. The pre-workout supplementation and the health supplementation has changed. So let's briefly address that before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video. Before we do, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Now regarding training, when I started at the age of 15, over 20 years ago, Weider Principles high volume training was king. I started with the cookie cutter Arnold Schwarzenegger training split of training opposing body parts, chest and back, arms. And then the third day would be shoulders and legs, which most of these workouts lasted for like two and a half hours. And by the end, you could physically smell ammonia, right? It was drug free. You follow a, a basic high protein, low fat diet, which is horrible for drug free athletes. And you would just train and train and train and train and train to the point you would smell ammonia and then do it all over again, training six days a week, chest and back twice, arms, twice shoulders and legs twice man we've come a long way and you could say that progressive overload is also the old way of uh, designing your training program but it's gone through so many different iterations i mean it started as high intensity training developed by arthur jones and then the mentor brothers took that to the next level and developed their own version of hit then dorian yates probably laid the groundwork for a lot of people that introduced them to progressive overloads with a combination of HIT. And then Dante Trudel developed Dog Crap, which was groundbreaking for a lot of us. I mean, I read that cycle for Penny's um, thread on intense muscle in 2004 after it just came out. And of course, I did uh, Dog Crap training as a drug free athlete as well, but I certainly made way more progress on DC training compared to the Weeder principles, <laughs> which I did before that time. And then Fortitude is a derivative of that. Mountain Dog Training is a derivative of that. And the JP, probably the king of progressive overload nowadays. Man, that's a goldmine of information. So I feel that progressive overload, even though it's been around for quite a few decades already, I feel that all the specialized training that falls underneath progressive overload is the new king of training methodology. It's worked very well for myself, many of my clients, everybody that I talk to and look up to. Progressive overload, man, I love that stuff. It's very challenging, it's very fun, and it will put hard, dense muscle on your physique. And I never experienced that from the Weeder principles or the high volume training that I used to do in the past. And I even dabbled a little bit when I was using performance enhancing drugs later in my uh, bodybuilding journey. Really, nothing compares to progressive overload and that should be considered to be the new way of getting the job done. Now, when we look at nutrition, I mean, it could be a whole video in itself, but we used to follow the seven foods that work. Chicken, broccoli, brown rice, tuna, potatoes, uh, bananas, <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? All the bro foods. 
and then you would boil everything to death. Low fat diets and all that kind of stuff. Man, a lot has changed nowadays, or at least the coaches who understand nutrition a lot better. They individualize nutrition based on digestion. Not seven foods that work, not these cookie cutter bro foods that seem to work well for a lot of people because some people don't respond well to chicken. They don't digest it well. So individualized nutrition is what we do nowadays. And the, the nutrition that works very well for me might not work very well for you. Some people like keto. Some people like high carbs. Some people like a vertical diet. Some people like carnivore, right? There's a million different nutritional strategies that are um, options nowadays. And you stick with the one that your stomach agrees with. And if that's carnivore, great. If it's the vertical diet, great. If that's vegan, great. Whatever works for your body, that's the nutritional strategy that you're going to follow until it doesn't work anymore. And then you need to make some adjustments. You don't have to get married to the chicken, boiled chicken breast, the brown rice and the broccoli in any way, shape or form. And the old way, and I'm going to get some slack for this, but calories in, calories out, I feel that's the old way. You have to look at nutrition in the following way. Yes, calories in, calories out is a good metric to track what you're consuming. It's very difficult to track how much calories you're actually burning. And again, the, the body doesn't necessarily work on calories alone. It works on nutrition. And it's very difficult to accurately pinpoint whatever you're putting in your mouth is going to turn into ATP, right? That's the primary energy source of the body, which has calories, right? You can... If you want to have smart calculations, you could calculate exactly how much calories you're consuming being used for ATP production and then being recycled because, well, ATP synthesis and ADP and the Krebs cycle and all that stuff, electron exchange, there's a huge recycling process that goes along, which is way too much to get into the, this video. But calories in, calories out is a little bit of an right, surface level method to look into nutrition because nobody exactly knows how many calories you're eating and how many you're burning and excreting. I mean, listen, if uh, bowel acid has calories, hair has calories, skin has calories, and you're losing a decent amount that of that over the day, and nobody can quantify how many calories you're exactly losing by growing hair, skin, nails, um, you're peeing out calories, you're, right, you're producing bowel acid, some of which is getting reabsorbed and some of which is getting excreted. So that makes it very difficult to accurately track how many calories are going out of your body or are being burnt during activity or being sedentary. So calories in, calories out is a little bit of an outdated metric. I would rather look into the hormonal response to foods and how particular micronutrients affect particular processes in the body that need to be sustained while you're in a caloric surplus, maintenance, deficit, depending on your goals. If you want to build muscle or build muscle and lose fat at the same time or sacrifice a little bit of muscle and burn the maximum amount of fat as you can or to get shredded as fast as possible, I would rather look into the hormonal response and the micronutrient intake than track calories and then use it as a sole determining factor for the success of the outcome of the off-season maintenance phase or cutting phase. We used to do hours of cardio, two hours a day. I don't think it's required nowadays. Step counters, increasing uh, moderate activity during the day, keeping track of how many steps you're performing over the day, walking in between sets, right? Making these little adjustments to your caloric intake and energy expenditure levels that are not uh, determined by doing cardio or the gym, all these little metrics that we can all measure and uh, keep up are certainly more conducive to fat loss than hours and hours and hours and hours of cardio, which will inevitably raise your cortisol levels to the moon, preventing you from gaining any significant amount of muscle mass in the process or require a ton of pharmacological interventions just to offset that. So again, hours of cardio is the old ways, step counters, moderate activity, throughout the day is the new way. And then you do cardio for cardiovascular health and burn a decent amount of calories while staying moderately physically active while doing chores, for example, or just making sure you get your target steps in over the day, right? Whether that's walking in between sets or just doing 10 minute walks, many different ways to get your steps in. And then regarding the health supplementation for the liver, we used to take silymarin 
and liver 52 on cycle, thinking that would magically keep our liver health intact. Because those studies were all very promising, even though they were all performed on severe alcoholic steatosis, which doesn't manifest when you're on cycle because you're not supposed to be drinking alcohol. And the liver damage that occurs while taking oral steroids or injectable steroids is different than the liver damage which occurs when you're drinking a ton of alcohol. So nowadays we take Tutka and injectable glutathione, far superior over the old methods for liver health. For the lipids, we used to take garlic extract and red yeast rice. Nowadays we take citrus bergamot and fish oil with each meal. And of course, a little bit better cycle design so we don't crush our HDL into abysmal concentrations because we keep our estrogen levels more favorable. For the kidneys, cranberry juice and kidney stuff, severely outdated astragalus root extract and proper electrolyte intake is far more beneficial for kidney health. And nowadays, many bodybuilders are very proactive to put some ancillaries in place to protect their kidneys. So whether that's a Tadalafil or Telmasartan or Nubivalol, right, there's many different medications out there which could help with kidney functioning over time that you're exposing yourself to performance enhancing drugs, especially when you reach boat load territory, then you definitely need some blood pressure medication or beta blocker or a sodium glucose transporter type 2 inhibitor in place right, to protect your kidneys because unlike the liver, they generally don't regenerate as fast, even though astragalus root extract and some of the methods we've, which we have at our disposal nowadays could at least lower the inflammation within the kidneys, slowly improving columellar filtration rate over time. Now, regarding the insulin sensitivity, we used to take vanadyl sulfate and chromium picolinate with each meal. And nowadays, berberine and apple cider vinegar is considered to be a little bit superior approach, especially considering that chromium at higher dosages could potentially um, impact your kidney functioning negatively also. For the blood pressure, beetroot extract and cardetone still works. But nowadays, proper electrolyte intake, especially magnesium and calcium, if you regulate that well, you can already sustain your blood pressure very effectively. So for the kidney functioning and the blood pressure, estragalus root extract and proper electrolyte intake, perhaps taurine intake, that's the new way. And in many cases, there's no blood pressure medication required. And then when it comes to the muscle building supplements, we used to take whey protein. I feel that collagen and gelatin protein is far Superior also doesn't cause acne and provides the building blocks for skeletal muscle, connective tissue, hair, a far superior supplement over whey protein. We used to take BCAAs, now we take essential amino acids, a much broader perspective of amino acids compared to the three, which are a branch chain. And, and, and keep in mind, if you start doing your research in the nutrition, most people over the course of the day, just from the generic foods that we eat in the fitness industry, you already get 20, 25, 30 grams of branch chain amino acids over the day by itself. So why not get a little bit more diverse, diverse amino acid profile in the form of essential amino acids? Creatine used to be popular then, still holds up today. I like creatine monohydrate and none of the other creatine forms, which of course, during that old days, a gazillion different creatine formulas came out and nowadays creatine monohydrate is still holding up. And of course, all of the old pre-workout formulas would contain DMAA and beta alanine, which would make you tingle from your toes to your forehead and everything in between, especially the butthole. So I, I've been avoiding both for the last couple of decades. And that's why I take Gorilla Mode Nitric or Energy, which give me far better results and none of the itching and paresthesia, um, right, when I'm at the gym. The gray area supplements, pro-hormones. Remember those? Epistain. Man, there used to be a ton of them. I, I didn't really dabble or experiment with the pro-hormones. Used to be very popular with the naturals, <laughs> believe it or not, simply because the pro-hormones were over-the-counter. You could buy them at GNC or uh, online in the early days of online shopping. And they were not on the doping list. So a lot of these uh, old-school um, competitors that say they were drug free were using these over the counter pro hormones that would pass uh, the drug screening, even though they were basically 
um, designer steroids or discontinued steroids. Superdrol, for example, right? A discontinued steroid that was developed alongside anadrol. Um, that's a pro-hormone that is still being used today and has its practical applications. But most of the pro-hormones have now been replaced with SARMs. And, and to be fair, now that we've been uh, a couple of years into the SARM uh, journey, I would say that the SARMs are not really holding up either. And all the stuff that is actually being used by bodybuilders are classified as SARMs, but technically not SARMs. So those are the metabolic modulators or the growth hormone secretagogues. GW1516, SR9009, MK677. And I would argue that given the chance of the SARM community, they would put 5-amino-1-MQ in that category as well because it has one of those uh, numerical names just like most of the other SARMs. So when it comes to cycling, remember time on is time off. <laughs> Nobody follows this anymore. Nobody. Nobody does time on, time off. I already debunked that in a previous video. You can watch that here. Nowadays, we do either blasting and cruising, and the duration of the blast is determined by the blood work results. So as long as the blood work results are good or acceptable, then the blast keeps going. And I know people that have been blasting their socks off in moderate dosages, right? You have to keep yourself healthy. They've been blasting themselves with 500, 750, 1,000 milligrams of anabolic steroids uh, in total, right? Of maybe two or three different kinds. And they've been running it for a year straight without any adverse effects because all of the new methods to sustain health are in place. The Tutka, the injectable glutathione, the astragalus root extract, the ancillaries, the frequent blood work. Some guys do it monthly nowadays. Monthly. I've done it monthly for many years because, well, I wanted to stay on cycle, but I also wanted to see how these drugs would affect my health parameters, right? And if I saw something was off and I couldn't mitigate that or resolve it, then it was time to come off and do a cruise and clean out. And honestly, I would argue that there's something to say for coming off for three or four months out of the year and just rely a little bit on muscle memory to restore the muscle mass within a month or two of coming back on cycle. So your cruise is an actual cruise, but involves ACG or HMG just to sustain testicular function and really calm everything down so you can recover and not subject yourself to super physiological dosages because even well, when we cruise, we cruise in 250 test or one milligram per one pound, which a lot of people seem to be against, but it's worked very well for me and uh, most of my clients to sustain the muscle mass during a cruise. I would argue that it's okay to come off for a couple of months, use a, little bit, use a little bit of ACG or HMG to restore testicular function, clean out, improve your health, get your creatinine down, your liver enzymes down, get all these blood work markers back into normal parameters and then rely on muscle memory to restore all of that over the duration of a month or two. I mean, look at me. I'm, if I were to increase my calories, I would be right back where I left off pretty much a year ago. So time on, time off, pretty much debunked. We go by health parameters and the more intelligent cycle design and the ancillaries and the health supplementations that we have at our disposal nowadays allow us to use the lowest effective dose for the duration of time that we're healthy and get results from the lowest effective dose. And when the lowest effective dose is no longer effective, we go to the next increment of the lowest effective dose. So let's say you get great results on 500 tests. It's no longer effective. You do your blood work. You see that uh, health is um, acceptable or you can um, improve that with a couple adjustments to your nutrition, your health supplementation, your ancillaries, your cardio, whatever else. And you feel the need to bump up the dose a little bit to keep progressing regarding your strength, your muscle mass, and your overall muscularity. And you bump it up to 750, for example. You add in the Primo or the uh, Baldenone or the Nandrolone or whatever else you're interested in and that your body responds well to. So not 13 weeks on tests and then 13 weeks off. Or 16 weeks on test and primo, and then 16 weeks off. <laughs> now that we, we don't really do that nowadays. But still, people, um, I get those questions every day. But Steve, I was on cycle for eight weeks. Should I take eight weeks off? And I, well, tell them what I tell you guys many, many times. You can let me know down below in the comment section which reply that is. It starts with a B and ends 
with a K. Test is best still holds up, but not for everybody. Test is best for me. Test is best at higher dosages of 2000 milligrams per week. I felt great. My blood work was great, or at least acceptable considering I was running 2000 milligrams of steroids per week. I could not have had that blood work on a combination of test and another compound, test and Primo, for example, or test and Tren, or test and whatever, right? On 2000 milligrams of test, I found that my blood work was pretty damn acceptable considering the dose. But there are people out there that don't respond well to tests, right? Regarding the hair loss or anxiety or whatever else. Some people just don't respond well to tests. So even though test is best for some people, it's not best for everybody. And that's why the Nandrolon only cycle is there. Because if you suffer from hair loss and you feel that um, the hair is important to you, like some people suffer from hair loss and they don't care. And that's why the MAC3 razor is in place in case you want to shave your head and just uh, go through life um, like the rock, if you have the muscularity and the height and the tan to match. If you do care about your hair and your and the testosterone is making you lose your hair, there's the Nandrolone only cycle. Tian and Clark has a website and a huge private Facebook group where hundreds of people they share their experience and get good results from a Nandrolone only cycle, perhaps in combination with the Anabol, which I personally, I don't really agree. I would rather do ACG as a base to get a little bit of estradiol and testosterone in your system. But right, he's the expert when it comes to the nandrolone only cycle. And if you're a testosterone non-responder, go to the other part of the internet and follow those approaches, right? And it's it's a, new, a reasonably new approach, but it works for so many people. It works for a lot of people. I, I tried it myself. Did it work for me? Yeah, I got great results. Did I notice anything regarding my hair loss? No, because I don't suffer from hair loss. It's not an issue. And even if I were to lose all my hair, I would still take Test and Primo, to be honest, right? So this is a little bit of a new cycle design for people with unique side effects that uh, or can be considered testosterone non-responders. There's an alternative method in place. But still, for most of us, for a lot of people, testosterone is going to be the base of most of the steroid cycles that we do. And there's so many other compounds that you can add on top with a little bit of adjustment regarding the dosage you can take your test only cycle to the next level. I mean, that's why these steroids were designed after all. Boldenone is based during contest prep, very popular in Europe. I know many people who did this for years. It still holds up to this day. I've recommended this to some clients who just can't seem to get shredded on test. And you take the testosterone out and replace that with boldenone. They might already be on trimbolone, masterone, primobol, and whatever else, right? Individualized cycle design. And at one point, 300 milligrams of test just prevents them from getting absolutely uh, shredded because testosterone upregulates epidermal growth factor to an extent that you can't really say for some of the other anabolic androgenic steroids. And of course, testosterone converts into estradiol, which might also prevent you from getting absolutely shredded, in particular uh, stubborn body fat areas which respond to estradiol. Testosterone comes out, boldenone goes in as a base, right, which boldenone arguably is the closest of all the injectables to testosterone, um, although albeit that it doesn't um, produce estradiol. Some people say that they get esterone conversion of boldenone into esterone. But I've also seen some blood work where esterone, estradiol, and estriol are completely bottomed out when using boldenone as a base. But nowadays, I feel that the boldenone doesn't really hold up anymore after doing extensive research on the clinical data. So even though a boldenone base will still work in a contest prep setting, for average people, people who would like to look good and either don't respond well to testosterone or need to get absolutely shredded, but it's not in the or not for a reason of doing a contest, I would prefer a primabolin base, perhaps with some DHEA and pregnenolone in place to supply the neurosteroids and potentiate a little bit of testosterone and estradiol production. So you have primabolin as a base. Several of my clients do that. These are not considered hardcore bodybuilders, but many of you guys are not hardcore bodybuilders either. So it might be something you can be uh, considering in the future. That's 300 to 400 milligrams of primabolin as the base cycle. Then either DHA and pregnenolone in place to provide neurosteroids and a little bit of testosterone and estradiol conversion, or ACG instead. 
So instead of taking Baldron as a base to fulfill some of the functions of testosterone and not get a negative effect from higher estrogen levels or this epidermal growth factor that is being stimulated by testosterone, switch to primobolin, which is still medically prescribed in a small amount of countries and has a lot more clinical data on it, um, at least not in a negative sense, right? Most of the clinical data of primobolin is positive or positive overall, and then have something in place to either sustain the HPTA or part of it, the testicular function aspect, or provide the neural steroids for a little bit of testosterone and estradiol in the bloodstream. Now, of course, you can go a little bit more hardcore and then supplement exogenous estradiol, but that kind of mitigates the purpose to replace testosterone for boldenone or primo or deca because you're suffering from some of the side effects which are coming from higher dosages or higher concentrations of estradiol. So again, a little bit of experimentation is involved in these kind of scenarios when you remove testosterone as a base. But when it comes to using boldenone as a base during contest prep, I would rather run a gram or gram and a half of Primo over a gram, gram and a half of boldenone. Again, these are insane dosages, I know, but that's bodybuilding contest prep. The dosages are a bit higher than uh, most of you guys are uh, used to. Another popular combo during a contest prep or a cutting phase in general was low test, high train, high masterone. And honestly, again, high test, high primo, I feel is far superior. Now, primo bone, I know, I understand it's not available to everybody. But if you only have 1500 milligrams of something to play with, right, in, in a cutting phase, so the dosage is going to be a little bit higher, doing low test for the sake of increasing your trend, because you feel that some of the side effects of this combination is coming from the testosterone itself, because Tremblone has higher binding affinity to the androgen receptor and kicks off the testosterone from the receptor, resulting in night sweats or mood changes or high estradiol or right, whatever else. It's all testosterone's fault and not Tremblone's fault. But in reality, you just want to take more trend, which, uh, well, there was a forum dedicated for that. And I don't think many of those guys walked away with a good review. So... I low test, high train, high masterone. I think that's a little bit outdated, an old way of running a cutting cycle. I've gotten great results with many of my clients just with high test and high primo in a one-to-one -one ratio. I mentioned it many times before. And then when push comes to shove, it's time to look phenomenal. You either add in an oral like Winstrol or in a, for a contest prep, you add in the halo test in the last two weeks. And these guys show up harder, denser, fuller, than a low test, high trend, high masterone cycle because this masterone makes you flat AF and excretes all these electrolytes over the duration that you're cutting. And of course, the trembolone will keep you full and hard and dense. But when it comes to stepping on stage or under the lights for a photo shoot, the difference is very noticeable. Low test, high trend, high masterone, outdated. I prefer high test, high primo and an oral to finish it off. Debo Kickstart, I addressed that already. You can watch that here. Nowadays, I prefer patience. Maybe start ACG as your first cycle or start the ACG before you start your cycle or at least the first cycle to assess your testosterone potential. You can watch that video here if you haven't already. Get a little bit used to super physiological concentrations of testosterone. See how you react, any anxiety, any uh, sleep issues, any uh, intolerable libido changes. Then you go and test, and then maybe uh, you go off ACG for a while. You reintroduce the ACG a little bit later, albeit at lower dosages, just a maintenance dose of 250 IUs three times per week to sustain testicular function, more than enough. And then later on, you add as your first oral of choice, Terinabol, which is very easy to manage. Most people don't really get side effects unless you suffer from a hair loss, right? Terinabol is reasonably safe, certainly doesn't lead to tremendous lower back pumps, which are uh, very common with Dianabol, but part of that is coming from the methyl estradiol, which seems to be metabolism resistant and makes a Dianabol kickstart for the first four weeks more cumbersome than what it's worth. There's better ways to approach it. And one way of uh, approaching it better is just by being patient and selecting your compounds a little bit more um, intelligently, I would say.
Another method is double the tests of DECA. So you go on an off-season cycle, 500 tests, 250 milligrams of DECA, and then on hand, you have a boatload of uh, ancillaries. You have your Arimidex in place, which nowadays we prefer aromacin because it doesn't change your lipids as much. And you have your cabergoline in place, or your Promipexol, or your Bromocryptine, because just in case the prolactin shoots up from the nandrolone, because testosterone and nandrolone is estradiol heaven, and then nandrolone is a progestogenic 19 nor working on your pituitary and the estrogen is high, so it also works on your pituitary. And then your prolactin is sky high and you need the cabergoline or the primipexol or the bromocryptine to bring your um, prolactin levels down. But now at least you don't get dick a dick and the caber is working on your heart and the nandrolone is working on your heart and now slowly left ventricular hypertrophy starts to manifest but you're not doing MRIs or ultrasounds to uh, really determine the rate of progression of left ventricular hypertrophy. Your blood pressure might be high because your estrogen is high and the nandrolone promotes a lot of water retention. And now you have to mitigate that with some of the other ancillaries and the estrogen is high, you develop gynecomastia and the, the, the tamoxifen needs to be used, lowering your IGF-1 levels and you now you're not recovering. Just going from all the potential side effects which could manifest from 500 tests and 250 deca. Again, a lot of people experience a cascade of these side effects because they approach their cycles uh, like this. They read it somewhere in the message boards. Sounds uh, promising because again, they don't want deca dick, but you know, a lot of potential for aromatization um, from this unique combination can occur. So again, I would prefer just to go with tests and then adding in a boldenone or a prima boldenone or even a low dose trembolone, which Right, doesn't have the potential to raise aromatization of testosterone into estradiol, which nandrolone is known to do. And then you don't need so many ancillaries to mitigate all these little side effects, which could potentially manifest. Or the old way of cycling is that you have your entire cycle planned and laid out in front of you with no room for modification or deviation. <laughs> I know I spoke to so many old school bodybuilders who said, I'm going to do a 16 week cycle and then I'm going to go off for a while. And I got, uh, you know, week one to four is uh, test and this, right? And then uh, week five to eight is uh, this and this, right? And it's all planned out. It's all ready, right? They have everything in stock. It's all ready, but they don't account for the potential changes or side effects or, um, right? Things that happen in life. There, there's no room for variability or flexibility. It's all set in stone. And if something happens that they did not expect, and now they get a ton of side effects somewhere midway through the cycle, and it was all laid out ahead of time, and they don't even have the ancillaries or some of the methods available in stock to alleviate or mitigate the side effects which are now manifesting. And then stubbornly, right, it's on paper, I had this insane plan that I wanted to follow for the next 16 weeks. And then they just keep going and going and going. Or they don't have the knowledge to make changes to their protocol when particular side effects start to manifest or when life happens. I mean, in this day and age, you don't know when the lockdowns are going to be back. And I know so many guys that laid out a cycle. I mean, I do consultations like this all the time. They laid out a cycle for, I don't know, whatever uh, weeks in duration. And then a lockdown happens. They can't go to the gym. They get demotivated. And they continue with their cycle because it's on paper. Right now, I plan for a 16 week cycle with 500 tests and this and this and this and this. And even though the gyms are closed and I'm not training and eating horribly, uh, right? I'm not following the bodybuilding lifestyle. I still continue with my cycle. No, dude. When the gym's closed, you can't train. You go back to hormone replacement or you go off completely and do post cycle therapy. Why waste hormones when you can't even train? Right? So that's. <laughs> Some guys would just continue this way. Um, and that's definitely not the right way to approach it. So you start somewhere, hopefully with the lowest effective dose. You have ancillaries in stock for potential side effects. And you hope that all these ancillaries expire. You don't need to use them, right? They reach the end of the expiration date and you didn't even open the box. Well, you spend a little bit more money and don't worry those ancillaries will still be good five years after reaching the expiration date if you store them properly. So you, you can just leave them in your steroid cabinet just in case a side effect manifests in the future. You get everything in place or at least places where you can order them on a short-term notice so the side effects don't um, 
reach into a horrible territory where you have to abort your cycle. So you have all of that in place. You start with the lowest effective dose that you can tolerate and get results from, and then you slowly build your way up, right? With flexibility. Lowest effective dose for a duration of time where you have a clear goal. When you're close to that goal or your window of time starts to shorten, so let's say you have a six-week training block, at the end, you do your blood work, you see how your body changed both from the outside and the inside, and then you make another adjustment to keep yourself healthy and raise the bar a little bit higher regarding your goal. Say, I want to be uh, 100 kilos at the end of the next training block, step by step, step by step, always some flexibility involved. You can't make too many changes. Like you're not going to make changes day in, day out. You make changes based on the blood work and then continue for another couple of weeks. But it's very stupid, in my opinion, to lay out a cycle for the next couple of weeks fixed and set in stone without any room for deviation. And then it's it, it well almost asinine <laughs> to ride out that cycle when gym's closed or ride out that cycle when your body is certainly not agreeing to the dosages or the compound selection. But I've heard so many stories of people doing that. You know, oh, this guy wrote me a cycle, I paid $50 for it, and now I'm going to, you know, see it through. Yeah, no, it's not a, not a good approach. And I really hope that helps, guys. I hope this gives you some food for thought on how to approach your next steroid cycle or maybe reconsider what you're doing right now. Because even though some of the things that um, were popular in the 80s or 90s, and there's better ways to approach it nowadays. Really, guys, there's better ways to approach it. And in the end, the best steroid cycle is the one that works for you as an individual. So that's individualized, personalized cycle design that gives you good blood work, minimal side effects, good results, and something that you can run for a sustainable period of time, allowing you to reach your goals. That's the best cycle. Don't get married to some of these old protocols that will probably detract from your health. And even though they might be effective and will give you good results from a, a physical perspective, 10, 20 years later, um, you might end up regretting it. I'll leave it at that, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vigorousteve.com slash shop. Personalized advice always available through consultations. You can find the rates in the consultations section. Follow me on Instagram at vigorousteve. New age, modern cycling approach, front double bicep for the vigorous crew. You guys know what to do. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.